All right, let's pray together and we'll get started. Father, we are so thankful uh, for the opportunity to gather here together, Lord, to know that uh, when we do this, you have promised us that you will be right here in our midst. And so we, we rejoice in that, Lord. We thank you that you are, you are in our midst. We are in your presence. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that we would be so very glad about that. And Lord, as always, we ask you just to, to encourage us as we sing and as we share around your word. Lord, uh, again, I pray you'd bless the preaching and teaching of the word this morning. Lord, may, may your words uh, find a home in our hearts. Lord, may it change us. Uh, and, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Because he's good, right? <clears throat> I love this song so much, can't hardly sing it without... Um, yeah, I'm crying. That's the word. Crying. <clears throat> crying, weeping, ugly crying, sobbing. Because it, uh, it's so true in my life. I know I'm not the only one. Um, the goodness of God. take off running from the Lord, he comes running That's after right. That's Isn't right. Isn't that the truth? That's right. Yes. His goodness is running, running after me. Running after me.
CD. You weren't lying about that song, man. It's crazy. Calvary Kids, join me. Uh, volunteers the Trunk or Treat, thank you guys so much. Y'all, y'all crushed it. Everybody did so good. Kids, you guys had fun? Yeah, it was great, man. Yeah. It's that candy. They're just low now. All right. Speaking of, I'm sorry, but I have a lot left over, which means your kids will probably receive it. So it's kind of on y'all, though. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church. God, I, th- I thank you for uh, the beauty of just singing together and, and praising you and worshiping you and uh, just speaking of your faithfulness, God, I, I pray as we go through this other avenue of doing that, which is reading your scriptures and getting into them. And Father, I pray that you will just reveal yourself more and more to us uh, in, in today in the form of uh, Melchizedek. In Jesus' name, amen. You can remain seated. I want us to, as a congregation, I want us to read Psalm 24, 1 through 10. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Let's stand together. I'm no longer.
Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord. I want to be a worshiper that is filled with your spirit first and foremost. But I want your spirit to move in all of who I am. My heart, my mind, my emotions, my my body. I want every bit of who I am to be centered and focused and geared toward you with a desire to glorify you and to spread the fame of your name in the world. I want to be a spirit-filled worshiper who worships in spirit and in truth. I want our church, Lord, to be a church that is so desperate for you, so desperate to be a, a, a people who worship you rightly, so desperate to be a people who long to be proper image bearers of the Son of God in the world. I want our people, Lord, to be so consumed with you that they can't help but spread the new creation everywhere they go. I don't want us to simply know about you, Lord. I want us to know you intimately. I don't want us to simply come on Sundays and come on Wednesdays and, and gather throughout the week, Lord, and, and go through some type of religious ritual ceremony because those are simply the things we do on those certain given days. I want us to be desperately desiring to know you intimately. God, I pray that this next few moments as we open up your word, that that would be the desire of our heart. That we would long to be a people who know you and desire to glorify the one we know. That's what real praise and gratitude and service and making noise is all about. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Psalm 100. We are in the midst of a Thanksgiving series where we are walking through Psalm 100. I dealt with verse 1. Two weeks ago, Brother James dealt with verse 2 last week, so I think it's probably fitting we deal with verse 3 this week. Amen. Seems like the right place to go, the right order to go in. There is a temptation, church, when it comes to making a joyful noise, when it comes to serving the Lord with gladness and singing to Him, when, when, when we are called to praise His name and to glorify Him and to worship Him, there is a, a temptation that can come that many people in our day have succumbed to, a temptation that is prevalent among Western worshipers. And that is that we can worship God or we, we emote very well. We can emote, right? Our affections are stirred. Our emotions are moved. And so we, we are able to sing with emotion. 
And, and our body can follow suit. We can raise our hands. We can clap. We can yell. We can make noise. There's a, a sense in which we do a good job of emoting and we do a good job sometimes of, of letting our body express those emotions or affections. But the temptation can be to remove the intellectual aspect out of our making noise, out of our service, and out of our worship. We are not called to simply make noise. We are not called simply to have affections. The truth is you can go to any concert by any group or any band that may have nothing to do with Jesus and you can see people emoting and then those affections or those emotions causing them to move physically. They may dance and jump and sway and, and hold their phones and do this thing. You know what I'm saying? Any, any concert can, can get people to do that. Any, any athletic endeavor, the Cowboys are going to play tonight. Any, anybody can sit and watch the Cowboys and, and what's happening there causes emotions. It causes physicality, the, the expression of those emotions. Anybody, that can, that can happen in any kind of setting. But when it comes to proper singing and serving and making a joyful noise to the Lord. Our intellect, our mind is supposed to be engaged. We are supposed to have our mind and our intellect engaged, our affections stirred, and then our body follows suit. That's the way it's supposed to work. There's a song we sing around here, Good, Good Father. I like the song very much. But there's a line in that song that says, peace so unexplainable, I can hardly think. Well, we changed the words to that. Now, I think I know what Chris Tomlin means in that line. But we didn't want to give the impression to anyone in our church that when the peace of God comes over you, you can't think anymore. Right? That you're encountering God and all of a sudden your mind just stops working. No, the thing is, what actually brings the peace is when the mind is engaged, right? When we engage the mind to think about the character and the nature and the attributes of God and how God works, that's when the peace comes. And once the peace comes, it's not like we just stop thinking. And so we didn't want to give that impression, so we changed the words. I think we might not change it to anything really great, but... I think we changed it to uh, peace so unexplainable I can hardly breathe. I mean, you hyperventilate sometimes when the peace of God comes on me. I don't know. <laughs> What's wrong? Just peace of God, peace of God. I don't know. Speak, speak. Oh, speak? I can hardly speak? That's better at least. That's better because sometimes you just need to be quiet before God. So that, that makes sense. <laughs> hyperventilating when the peace of God comes over you. Oh, man. I'm glad we didn't change to that. Peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly breathe. <laughs> then I see you face to face because I'm dead. Um, <laughs> true praise, church. True praise. True gratitude will engage the mind as well as the emotions and the body. We're not just supposed to make noise. We're not just supposed to sing. We're not just supposed to raise our hands. We are supposed to do all of that out of a mind that is engaged in knowing the Lord. That is why proper doctrine and theology matter. And when we are properly moved by God toward being in awe of him, our affections are stirred and we respond physically. What Psalm 100 is going to do for us, what the writer of this psalm does for us, is he says, listen, make a joyful noise. Be loud. Serving with gratitude. Sing out loud. Based upon some things you know. And that's what we're going to look at in verse 3. Here is what verse 3 gives us. Knowable reasons to make noise, serve and shout. Know that the Lord, He is God. 
It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The first thing the psalmist writes here, know the Lord, he is God. There is so much that I could unpack from just this this phrase, this part of the verse. As I said, our gratitude is to be intellectual. We must know who we are praising. So that indicates to me a few things that we should not be, a few things that we should not do. Number one, we shouldn't be atheist. Right? We should be a people who believe in God. We should not be atheist. Atheists are people who are going against the very reason they were created. They're going directly against the reason why God has made them. So we're not to be atheist. There is a God. But we're also not to be praising the universe. You, you notice a trend that kind of is happening today, right? Of praising the universe. I was watching a show just the other day. And someone was trying to figure out their life. And they kind of figured out what they were supposed to do. And they said, the universe has guided me. Here at least... They are thinking of something bigger than themselves. So that's a good thing, right? They're at least thinking of something larger than themselves. But the problem lies in the fact that the universe itself is a creation. It is not worthy of our praise. It is not worthy of our gratitude. The universe is a receiver of being, not a giver of being. It is the receiver of being. Another thing we must not do is create God out of our own imagination. Here, people believe in God. It's not just the universe that they're praising. It's not just the universe that they're thankful for what's happening in their lives. They actually believe in God. And this, the, this God is personal in a sense to them. This is at least a personal God. But they do not believe in the God of the Bible. So they create a God out of their own imagination. This is probably what happens more today, at least in the United States, than any of the other two I've mentioned. People create a God in their own imagination or out of their own imagination. This is what I want God to be like. This is what I hope God is. This is how I wish he would be. And so we create this God out of our own imagination or out of our own individual lives. Now, here's the problem with that. Every single one of you your imaginations work differently than the person sitting next to you. We all have different imaginations. We are individuals. We have different experiences. And what happens is, if we all created gods out of our own imagination, how many different gods do we get in this room? We get a bunch, don't we? We get a bunch of different gods out of our own imagination and our own individual experiences. Because here's what we're doing. We're really creating a god that's okay with everything I'm doing. Right? I want a God that's okay with me doing this and this and this and this and this. I want a God that doesn't like that this person does this and this and this and this. All you're doing, right, is basically just making yourself God. Calling it God, but you're just making yourself God. So we must not be atheist. We must not just praise a generic universe we can't create God out of our own imagination. We must know Yahweh. The Lord there in your Bible should be capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's the word Yahweh. The personal name of God in Scripture. Know Yahweh, the God of the Bible. He is God. So we are to know God, and specifically, we are to know God of the Scriptures. We are to know that Yahweh is God. Remember, Jesus is praying in John chapter 17, and he's praying for the disciples. And as a contingent, he ends up praying for all of his people. And he's praying in John chapter 17. And, and he specifically says, Lord, I, you have given me authority over all flesh to give eternal life. And this is eternal life that they may know you and the one you have sent. When we read these words, know that Yahweh, he is God. It is believing what Jesus says. 
having that kind of eternal life. It is believing Yahweh is God and the one that he has sent. There is only one God who graciously reveals himself through nature, his word, and his son. This is who we must know if we are going to sing and serve and make a joyful noise properly. This is the one we must know. Now, I want to point out one more thing before I move to the next phrase. John Calvin points this out in his commentary on this passage. He says, it's actually not good enough to say, I believe in the one true God of Scripture. And I believe the one true God of Scripture has manifested himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So you can believe in the Trinity. You can believe in the Son of God. You can believe in the Father. All of that is great and wonderful and good. But if you do not live your life actively for the glory of God, you believe in a non-entity. I read that and I went, whoa. I had to read that again. What does he mean by that? What he means by that is you can say you believe in God and it can be the proper God. You can say you believe in Jesus. You can say you believe in God. But if you do not live for his glory, which is what God demands, then you're really not believing in the God of Scripture. We can live as if we are atheists. We can speak as if we believe. We can live as if we are atheists. We can live as if God is just some generic universe. We can live as if God is there just to please me and do what I will and, and appease what I want. We can call ourselves believers of the one true living God and in Jesus Christ, his son, we can do that all the while living how we're not supposed to in the first three that I mentioned. No, Yahweh, he is God. Second thing. It is he who made us and we are his. Here, this is about knowing the Lord as creator. It is he, this Yahweh, the one who is God. He made us and we are his. If we are going to praise and serve God with gratitude properly, we must know that he is creator and we are creatures. Now, that may sound like a generic acknowledgement. Yes, God created. I'm a creature. I'm part of the creation. He is creator. I'm not talking about stating that that is true. I don't think the psalmist is saying, I just need you to believe that in your mind. He is saying, listen, there is a way in which we are to live that reveals we believe we're creatures. You see, most people aren't atheists. Did you know that? Most people are not atheists. But that does not mean that they live their lives with a humble daily acknowledgement that they've been created by a creator. See, church, we can, we can believe God created. We can believe God created us. But are we humbly, daily living before him as if he's creator and we are creature? He made me. You see, if we don't acknowledge this, you know what we end up doing with ourselves? We end up treating ourselves as if we're creator. We begin living as if we are the God of our own lives. That's why I mentioned walking humbly before God. Because when we walk humbly before God, we are recognizing our place in this whole thing. He is God. He created me. I am to walk humbly before him. He's in charge. And if we don't live humbly as creatures, we will end up living as creator. We can do this in a couple ways. We can do this by, by in, we end up believing that everything just comes about through natural processes. Everything's just natural. Everything is a, is, is a part of nature. Or we can do this by living in admiration of our own abilities and our own achievements. When you believe 
you are a self-made person or a self-sustained person, you're living as creator, not creature. Now, how many people in our day live like that? How many people in our day live as if they're self-made men? The phrase, I pull myself up by my bootstraps. If it weren't for God, you wouldn't have any bootstraps. Or boots, or arms, or feet to pull them up. You know what I mean? But what happens is, is, is that many people who profess God can say, oh, I believe in God. I don't believe in this natural process stuff. I don't, I don't believe that things just occurred through nature. I believe God is supernaturally involved. But look at what I've accomplished in my life. Look at what I've done. You see what happens? That humble walking with God daily disappears. And now I take admiration in my own achievements and I take credit for my own abilities and what I have done. Taking credit for being and for well-being when both of those belong to God. The psalmist is telling us we have to know and live and praise Yahweh as creatures to a creator. That we belong to him. And by the very nature of belonging to him, we are creatures. If we do not know this, we will not be able to make noise, serve, and praise him properly. Then he says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. (coughs) More importantly than being created is being recreated. Amen? More importantly than being created is being recreated. The psalmist says, I want you to know you're my people. You're the sheep of my pasture. This is about redemption. We need to know God as creator, but we got to know God as redeemer. We have to know Yahweh as redeemer. He did not just create us. But he has bought us back. He has chosen us for himself. This is what the language of sheep and shepherd is all about. This is what it's referring to. Say, why do you know that? Because this is exactly what Jesus does with this language in the New Testament. Jesus takes the language of sheep and shepherd and he says, this is all about me dying for my people. John chapter 10 verses 11 through 16. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We should immediately look at Psalm 100 and say, Jesus believed that's him. Right? I am the Yahweh of the Old Testament who is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Church, in Psalm 100 when it says, You are his sheep, he is is your shepherd. He is referring to the redemption of bringing a people back to himself. Yes, he created you. Yes, you must walk humbly before him as a creature. But he also redeemed you. He bought you back. He brought you in. You have to know him as redeemer. As his chosen flock, those who have been gathered to him, he guides us, he cares for us, he protects us, he sustains us, he saves us. Who in the world has a better reason for gratitude and service and shouting and making noise than people who know that God and know God in that way? We must know Yahweh not only as creator but as redeemer. And then lastly... I want to end by saying that we need to know the Lord is always for us.
There is great comfort, church, in knowing God is always for you. Always. There is never a time where God is not for you. You belong to God twice, church. He owns you because he made you and he owns you because he bought you back. He owns you twice. Why in the world would he create you and redeem you to not care for you every day of your life? But it also means he can do with you what he wills and what he deems is best. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He is Yahweh, not you. And that means he gets to do what's best and what he wills with your life. Some of you right now may be experiencing such wonderful, great prosperity in your life. Things might be going really well for you. Then thank God for his blessing. Thank God for the prosperity he has brought into your life. Some of you, you are going through trouble and hardship and suffering, and it is difficult right now. It is hard right now. You wish things were different than they were right now. But that's where God has you. Thank him for the grace and power to persevere through difficulty. Thank him for what he will be for you in that difficult, hard time. Be grateful for his presence in the midst of the valley. This was Paul's attitude. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, I have learned to be content with much and with little. How, how can he say that? How is it possible that Paul could say, I have learned to be content when I've got a lot. And I've learned to be content when I don't have anything. How can a human being say that? He's come to the conclusion, Yahweh is God. He created me, he bought me, and he's for me. And if I'm going through hardship, he's for me. If, he's pro if I'm prospering, he's for me. No matter what I'm dealing with, no matter what I have, no matter what I'm going through, he is for me. Church, God is always for you. Always. See, we, we say that, but it's so difficult to believe, isn't it? That's why we've got to engage our mind now. It's so difficult to engage our mind to believe these things when, the valley is, when we're in the valley, right? Because we're just trying to survive. So we've got to prepare ourselves with intellectual engagement, heart, mind, body, soul, everything we have. We're engaging in proper understanding of who God is. So that when we go through the difficult time, we can actually still cling and believe God is for me. I know that this is horrible right now. But God's for me. No matter who you are. No matter where you are. No matter what you've done. No matter what you're going through. No matter what. If you've been created and recreated, Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, is for you. No matter what. So engage your mind. Engage your mind more faithfully than you've ever engaged your mind before. Engage your mind faithfully to the knowledge of God and you will become a more grateful person. If someone were to ask me the question, how do you become a more grateful person? How do I become more thankful? I mean, maybe you say, listen, I gripe a lot. I'm a complainer. I'm a fault finder. It's kind of my MO. It's what I do. I don't want to do that anymore. How do I change? I would say, know God better. And the more you know Yahweh as creator and redeemer, the more grateful you will become. The more noise you will make, the more your emotions will be stirred. Know God better. Knowing him, you'll come to know yourself better. 
That's the answer to the question. How many weeks did we do on all where we just talked about attributes of God? We did that because we want all of us to know God better. Because we know in knowing God better, we will worship Him better. Your joyful noise, your service, your singing will glorify and honor God as He deserves to be honored when you engage your mind to know who He is, allow your affections to be stirred, and shout and dance, turn on your phone and wave it. So what the psalmist does for us is the psalmist says, listen, I want you to serve and sing and shout. There's three S's, Brother James, right there. I want you to serve, I want you to sing, I don't want you to shout. But I don't want, to do, I don't want you to do it mindlessly. Because it won't last. Oh, you may feel good for a few minutes. Right? You may like how the beat hits on that song and it may make you feel good. And, but it won't last. What lasts is when you know Yahweh. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you. Lord, I think if we're honest, very few of us in this room could say, I'm grateful like I should be. I'm thankful like I should be. I think if we're honest, everyone in this room, we gripe too much, we complain too much, we get too frustrated and impatient, we deal with these things in our life because our flesh is strong, is against the Spirit. But Lord, if we truly belong to you, we don't really want to be that way. We don't want to be complainers. We don't want to be gripers and malcontents and fault finders. And that's not what we want to be, Lord. We want to honor you with our praise and our gratitude and our thankfulness. So, Lord, I just pray that you would move in our hearts today to help us become a people who know you better. That we become a people who desire to know you in a more deeper, intimate way than we ever have before in our lives. That we would be desperate, desperate to know you in a way we've never known you before. That we would go deeper and further up and further in to who you are. That your attributes would become things that not, not only do we know that you are, but we see that you do, and we would, we would bask in them, and we would become uh, taken up and captivated by them, Lord. Because when that happens in us, when that happens to us, when, when we are taken further up and further in, we'll become more grateful. We'll take another step in our gratitude and another step in our thankfulness. We'll move from glory to glory in this aspect of our lives. There is no one on the planet who has a better reason to praise and glorify and sing and shout and serve than those who have been born again by Almighty God. So Lord, help us to know you, your Son, Jesus Christ, more and more faithfully so that we can become better at our thanksgiving and that the world may see that we are different that we are not circumstance driven worshipers but we are driven by our knowledge and our love for the one true living God in 
is he who has made us and redeemed us and is always for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.